So yeah, we're in this conversation. We're going to be talking about Adon's experience in his meditation, which he had a spiritual experience at a Buddhist retreat, which wasn't. But at the same time, in that Buddhist retreat, you had you saw the image of Christ, and like it all unfolded from this image of Christ in which you saw. So, so yeah, this conversation is more about just like talking about how we. I've both experienced these forms of kind of breaking the ego down and, and then falling into this kind of spiritual awareness and openness and kind of just seeing where it goes from there. And like, what I want to kind of know a bit more and what I want to share with the viewers of this channel is kind of your experience and to kind of go a bit more in depth with it and go in a bit more detail and what it meant to you and how, how you felt about it. So, so yeah, man, if you want to go ahead with it, kind of like introduce how you came about well, let's actually just say how we actually first came to know each other. So, like, me and Nadon, like, he reached out to me from doing the channel, and um, he was in Dublin, and I was in also Ireland at the same time. So we arranged a meet up, and we kind of got off from there. We became really good friends at that point. We connected really well, and um, and then I went traveling for a little bit. I went to Switzerland, and I'm still traveling now, going around Europe and all of this. Absolutely. And um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm still traveling around Europe. I've been doing it for like well over five months now, and um, well, you know, kind of it's kind of a calling in a sense of that uh, hero's journey, you know, like, like call for adventure kind of experience. But yeah. um, but anyways, it's like so. Yeah, at that point, like, and um, because we connect so well, and we should like try and build something that's kind of a value. And that's how we started off the whole Mayorum Society in the Mayorum program. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, man, if you want to kind of go into a little bit about this experience you had, which I think was around December or November last year, and uh, kind yeah. of hit off from there, yeah. So there's this um, there's this place called uh, Chocnatusana. It's in Galway. Um, I'm from Galway in Ireland. Uh, how, the House of Understanding is what it translates to in English. And this place is a, a Buddhist retreat center run by a guy called Nick Scott. And uh, Nick, what Nick does is he uh, just teaches uh, Buddhist meditation in, I think it's a, called a Theravadan tradition. I'm sure the mm. commentaries will help there, um, help or chastise. Uh, and what they do every now and again or, or multiple times a year is like a longer uh, silent retreats. And they were doing a six day silent retreat over the new year. Um, and I decided to go to this thing because I was uh, in an absolute fucking state at the time and thought it would be interesting. So I was like, why not give this a go? So no technology or no books um, at this retreat. And what it was, the day was structured, just intense yoga and meditation. So there was like a morning sit followed by yoga, breakfast, and then three hours of thought meditation, lunch, another three hours of thought meditation, uh, a tea, uh, some more yoga, um, a dis like a talk uh, in like that, that tradition, and then a little bit of a discussion with the master guy, and then uh, another evening sit. And that was just like every day, six days, structure, routine. You didn't have to cook anything. It was all get to you. You couldn't talk to anybody. Silence. And uh, yeah, it was pretty insane. No technology, no books, just just. You could you could bring books, but I, I didn't bring anything. Um, yeah, you keep them at home, you know. <laughs> see what yeah, see but, what yeah. I mean, it's like well, so you weren't eating anything either, really, during this time. What? No, uh, I, I went there and I, I thought I'd do a fast, so I did like uh, I think a day and a half or two days of a fast, and then uh, I was like, oh fuck it, I'll go. I'll just I'll just eat and see what happens. That the right. the main guy there actually, Nick, he said uh, fasting is an easy way into the spiritual experience and you don't want it to be easy right i wonder why that is i mean it's like fasting i'd say especially when you've kind of got the situation where you know people are eating so much shit and people are eating so much bad food and then how that relates a lot to like people's mental illnesses in to a degree or people's you know sustaining certain mental frames of mind which are like not worthwhile or like they're not healthy for individuals I, i'd be interesting to see like how that even relates to Hmm. people's ability to have these spiritual experiences where like fasting could oh. quicken that whole process because you're not you're not consuming things you're not bringing things into your body so yeah. th those things that you bring into your body are kind of like influencing the way you even possibly 
see or perceive or process the world around you even so that's something kind of interesting there as well yeah yeah there's something there about breaking the flesh yeah it, it, believe it or not i saw this in a youtube comment that you never get fucking waste them on youtube like but uh this guy this some i think it was a uh yeah, a commentator said basically uh breaking the flesh they were talking about mma and martial arts and you break mm. the flesh you break the flesh to allow the spirit to come out and that relates i think here to like the fasting you you're like breaking the the flesh you're, you're sort of weakening the body so that you can get get into mm. get in touch with god or something like this yeah and you, you, I, I got this directly from elliot holtz he has like this uh, he has he does this string thing every three months or something like this where he um heads off to a remote location and fasts uh, and the whole thing is to figure out what he's doing for the next three six months of his life mm. i mean i think even that even that i think um there's something in that because i was reading about the meta which we're going to probably get into in a minute which was yeah. the the mind image which you then experience but they said that there's certain forms of meditation i think even self-mutilation to, for those extremists that want to go like full-on monk mode or whatever that they would even kind of penetrate their skin in some sense to maybe that could even possibly to be to like degrade the power of their materialistic body so mm. that they can maybe even possibly ascend outwards from that towards some sort of ego transcendence which would be like removing yourself from the materialistic world or something like that but yeah this is crazy because that even links in with what you're saying about the flesh or breaking the flesh yeah. in that sense yeah it's so weird Fucking hell. Yeah, that's like get, getting away from the body. And then I just imagine, you know, people who like cut themselves. Mm, like yeah. They're trying to they're trying to get out of their head into their body. Is what's going on there? Mm. Anyways, anyways, anyways. Um, so yeah, these days were structured as hell. So about on the fifth night then, um of you know not talking to people and of course I, I i broke that room and talked to someone but ideally you, you wouldn't talk to anybody so that you could keep in your own uh bubble for a while and you're only talking to the the master like the of the uh, the leader of the whole thing yeah and on the fifth night so it takes a couple of days for the dust to settle you'll hear you'll you'll hear them say so that the like the, the dust settles of of the life outside and then you uh you get into this like place of just absolute peace where the anxiety of of uh, of like you know the dopamine cycles of your of your phone and the internet and constant notifications that wears off and you're like you're happy just sitting on a couch and staring from me for two hours, um, and yeah, it's it's crazy. It's it's it was a it was a great experience, especially coming out of COVID um, and losing my mind. But um, on the fifth night, then uh, so e each night there would be a, a long sit and then you could stay sitting in this room if you wanted. Uh, there would be a candle lit at the top of the room. And the last person leaving had to blow it out. Mm. On the fifth night, I, I kept going anyways and people kept leaving and I kept going because I felt very good. But my, uh, I was getting into a very good uh, state. So eventually anyways, it was me and like another guy in the room, uh, completely dark except for this candle at the front. And I had, uh, my eyes were closed and then I had this sort of uh, vision pop up and I, I had no idea that this was possible at the time. But later on, as you said, it, I, I was talking to a guy and he's like, oh yeah, that's that's pretty standard if you get into a good meditative state. Yeah. So I saw like uh, fractal, fractal images of what I would call um, like stained glass windows, like in a church. And they were like beautiful uh, turquoise and purple. And then this morphed into like a uh, all seeing eyes sort of coming at me quickly. Mm. And from there, then this shifts to, and this is all sort of stretched out. I'm going through it really quickly, but the all seeing eyes then switched to uh, uh, Jesus in the, instead of a pupil, it was uh, Jesus's uh, head uh, in these all seeing eyes. And then this switches to uh, a chalice. Ah. Yeah, so like it was like a, a beautiful chalice that was sort of like rotating like this. Rotating like this in like a weird, like a ethereal plane. Right. From the chalice, again, 
this all is, is spread out over time. So it's, it's I'm going a bit too fast to really appreciate it. It was crazy at the time. And then I dropped into the room with my eyes closed into the same room that I was in. And what happened then was uh, Christ appears and is looking at me and he has the chalice in his hand and he, and he, and he, he like puts the chalice, he's like giving me the chalice and he's like, you know, whatever that means, but he's silent, but it's like, you know, come follow me or something like this is what I felt like drink from this chalice. Here, here's my blood. And then he points up towards the top of, of the room and then he starts flickering in and out of, of being like, you know, himself, uh, um, his majestic self. And then the, and then like a dead ghostly black and white version of himself. It was like, like flicking in and out of that. And then, uh, of course, like I, I, I keep wanting to go into the into further into the meditation, but I was like freaking out. And I was like, "What the hell is happening right now?" I was like, actually, the first thing I thought because uh, we live in the Instagram age is like, "Who the hell is going to believe what I just saw?" Yeah. I mean, it's like it's weird. You're saying like Jesus was flickering at one point, as if he's like this. It was that be like kind of like a. Uh... A kind of like disintegration is like being disorientated with like the real world as if like it's breaking down or is that i wonder if that's even like a representation of your like a even like a an imaginative representation of where you stand on your on on how you believe in christianity because you're more someone who leans towards christianity as you've told me before so it's so yeah I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that why what how what do you think you've learned from that experience and from what you've seen from that is, is it really just something that's just like out of your mind you can't really grasp it and you're not even really supposed to try and explain it that's another thing it's no I, I, I honestly like I, I have absolutely no idea um I, i'm trying i'm trying to figure out uh, and i'm beginning to study into like um the the roots of the roots of like all of these religious traditions and like the mystics and all these sorts of things. And then uh, I'm actually like reading a couple of books at the moment. There's one called um, The Parting of the Ways. And it studies uh, how Richard Craden is the guy's name. And he studies how, how the mystical traditions uh, are at the foundations of um, Freud and Jung's psychoanalysis. Mm. And all, he, he talks through all the mystical uh, visions that uh, people had throughout the centuries. Um, and it's like very much the same thing. But what he talks about is it's like really interesting is that uh, the unconscious is shaped by the religious tradition that the person grows up in or the mystic uh, experiences, uh, the mystic experiences, uh, visions that are contextual by their previous tradition and their uh, belief. So mm. um, Christian mystics would report visions of Jesus or the Virgin Mary. And the Jewish mystics would, uh, because they're like an iconic and they, they, there's no, there's no, um, direct uh, experience of God. It would be like, uh, no, there'd be, there'd be no images. Um, there'd be no images in their experiences. So that's, that's pretty interesting. What do I think was happening there? Uh, well, I grew up in like Catholic Ireland. Um, so whether I was an atheist teenager, uh, my family is my my mother particularly is like super religious, which is you know the uh, what is it religion came into Rome through through like uh, the slaves and the women, so it's like a it's like a sort of a a funny like just rewind of that. Um, and on my end, if I'm going by this guy Creighton, which is a really interesting idea, is that uh, my mind is just uh, our minds are just our unconscious minds are structured in by our previous like uh, experiences of our traditions and uh, and you can't you can't get outside of that and that's why mm -hmm. I, I saw this instead of um, something else yeah you saw that instead of a buddhist representation of spirituality because it's, it goes it went back to like your personal your personal unconscious like your personal experience but also maybe your ancestral kind of conditioned experience so it's like even I would even agree with Richard Craden on that because it's like to a degree I'd say may, maybe even possibly that it's that it's a conditioning of the religious ancestral kind of 
past of what we've uh, been brought up into because even that's fascinating as well because we have come from the kind of you know we, we I, I totally believe of this idea even with epigenetics because epigenetics kind of proves this in science is that we've kind of got all the ancestral knowledge continuously from where, where we've because we've evolved right so we inherit all of these things right so we inherit all of the information all of the dna all of the influence all of the experience from our ancestors to the point where we are at now so mm. it's but that some of them things are hidden some of them things need to be activated and even mm. that scientific explanation in some strange way kind of proves at least to me it doesn't have to be proved through the science or that there has to be a scientific explanation for it but because it's the zeitgeist of today it kind of has to be affirmed through that because it's the ego of the culture you know but it's like that itself proves all of the mythology all of the the idea of you know you need to go into the cave to seek the gold which you need to find the, the darkest cave you know because it's the same thing you're you're on you're you're bringing consciousness to the to the unknown which has not been activated yet within you you know this is i think even jordan peterson talked about that to an extent where it's like there's certain genes within you that you can activate if you do if you approach unknown ex, uh, uh, situations that you haven't experienced yet and that's really what the whole the whole individuation process is about by going towards the unknown going towards the things that you fear that you have anxiety towards so that you can then initiate yourself into the experience so, and and having that experience that empirical experience the first hand experience is the is the knowledge is the gnosis it's not it's not reading a book it's not getting information second hand knowledge all of that that's really irrelevant which is the whole problem of modern culture at the moment because we're we're more like oh put you into university and we study 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 and then inflate your ego to a point where we have some sort of superiority savior complex from our superiority of reading mm. because we then believe oh we've we've got all this knowledge that i need to save other people or i need to be a savior to to these other individuals even though i haven't saved myself yet mm. which is interesting like like we can only really be able to be able to heal other people when we've healed ourselves to a degree or at least when we've begun that journey but it's like so like even that proves to me on a, at least from a scientific perspective of the idea of epigenetics that we inherit genes from and this even relates to like something i was watching yesterday with my girlfriend we were watching um god I, i'll put the video in the description below but it was on domination culture and trauma and how trauma if it's not dealt with can successively go down your lineage and carry yeah. on if you don't confront it which is the epigenetic situation you're 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 carrying on the genes of those trauma responses but although the experience of that trauma so it's like um, is it the genes or is it the uh is it like the behaviors that result from the trauma like it's i'm, I'm guessing it's both like but, but you know the behaviors that result from the trauma so then it's like uh, what what's said and what's not said Mm. because you're you're afraid to say it or something like this you know yeah i mean it might it might i don't know specifically but it's like it could be just how prone of a situation it could be like there could just be it's more likely that maybe that individual is gonna start holding that so sort of like if you've grown up with like maybe an abusive father or something or then yeah. that if if that individual doesn't overcome that the abuse of that trauma then they're gonna kind of present it to the child possibly that they then have in the future because this is how it becomes kind of this repetitive cycle that's very um dominatory because it, it says like it's a domination culture in a sense where we're we're not kind of it's kind of like a, it's not with compassion in a sense yeah. there's no compassion that comes into our lives with, where we clarify and heal from these things and mm -hmm. it becomes a very kind of like egocentric existence and it's uh yeah it's just super interesting because it's like uh it's just it's, it's also it links into like kind of how 
because I was, I was saying to you before this like oh, we should talk about aliens in this like i was gonna like fuck going because i just put like a video up about fucking aliens um not aliens specifically but the, <laughs> the etymology of the use of the word alien and how it like relates to our disconnectedness with ourselves in modern mm. society because it's like because you had psychiatry before psychiatry is called psychiatry or the term the use of the word they're called alienists and it's super interesting because it's like we we often use the word like when we're trying to figure out like for example mayor Room society like the program is trying to fix the problem of alienation by helping you go on to your monomyth your 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 hero's journey right and and that confronts the alienation of modern of the modern world or our own position of being alienated so it's like links into all these things but we could talk about that in a minute but like um we need to get back onto topic here because i'm kind of deviating <laughs> i'm just like going on on a ramble here but like um yeah it's so yeah it's like uh but yeah it's just crazy because it's um but that makes that ex- i mean i could go on to like from that that spiritual experience you had yeah I mean like it's so weird because children kind of have the same thing or they're more prone to having this these kind of out of body experiences at least from what i remember because i remember personally i had a lot more spiritual i, I you could call them spiritual in retrospect like mm. but when i was a kid i wouldn't have said that because it, it was just a word it's just terms it's a concept so it's like um but from what I remember, it's like, no, no, I, I don't have these kind of experiences anymore. And I'd probably say that's probably because of having an ego. And this is probably why this probably goes back to the Lacanian terms is that, you know, in that mirror stage, you develop that ego because you see yourself. And then when you see yourself, you develop the ability to kind of um, crit- criticize what you're doing and be responsible, but also see yourself and have this whole good and bad is, you know, this whole reflect the reflection process of seeing other people and then seeing what you're doing, how that inflicts upon your kind of your unique innocence, you could say. So it's like developing that ego then maybe limits us off from being able to get in touch with Mm. our unconscious, which is not a bad thing because we need an ego to survive. That's why it's there. It's like a compensatory system. Mm. It's it's uh the ego develops if if we supposedly evolved from uh, from monkeys, it developed because it was there to compensate for these these extremely divided uh, laws of nature that would inflict upon our kind of existence. So we mm. needed an ego to kind of confront with that. But um, but yeah, I mean, like I had experiences of. Out, mostly out of body experiences. I want to say bring this up in a minute because you said you've you've came down into a position in your kind of meditative experience, yeah. and that's interesting because it's like you have this a lot. I think even Jung talked about this on and it, it's, it's an experience that he had was that he came up from the ground and he was above the world and he was like right. overseeing a lot of things. But um, it's the same. It's like the astral body. It's the astral body is leaving and it's falling down. And it's going back into the world in the same sense, like with the cross, like, like the cross, like crucifix has like a, its usual kind of depiction of what it is symbolically, Mm. but it's also a coming down and going across the plane of the material existence. So like the spirit or the soul comes down and then it goes across. So it's like, it's kind of like you're born into this world from heaven in a way. And yeah. you fall down onto the earth, and then you need to kind of experience the world, center of the world. Yeah, Me- meeting of heaven and earth. Yeah. Mm. What's what are the, what are these experiences that you had when you were younger? So, this is the thing. Like a psychiatrist say, "Oh, these are hallucinations, man. You know, you're just your your kids tripping out on something." But I would, I would have said yeah, like, might, but there's like that's it's a, you know the, the nuance there is there's, there's some psychiatrists and there's plenty of like university professors I've talked to as well that are. That are like, dude, mm. they're, they're just quiet about this because they're they're afraid of, I guess, how they'll come across. Like, a, mm. I, I was talking to a university professor recently, or recently, like in in the last year, 
who uh, completely who completely uh, talked down about uh, his entire department his department's a view or uh, they, they they take a certain view of um, psychology right. uh, in this department and he doesn't he, he doesn't agree with it and he's like I, I way prefer Jung um, Jung Freud and Jung but Jung specifically but he can't say that because in this department they're all uh, like the you know rational rational behaviorists um, right. I, I found that so interesting because it's so easy to uh, you know you see one thing and then you project it onto everything and you lose the nuance uh, and the same yeah. thing with psychiatrists there's plenty of psychiatrists like richard creative was a psychiatrist uh, and then he goes on he was initially he initially did chemistry and then he did chemical physics and then he went on and studied medicine and then he went on and did freudian psychoanalysis and then he went on and did jungian psychoanalysis and then he went and studied the the uh, the torah and the mishnah and then he went on and uh, did religion at Harvard. Yeah, so that's uh, the thing. That it just that's the beauty of it is that he, he became not a psychi psychiatrist anymore. He he studied so many different things that he became so diverse in his understanding that mm -hmm. he didn't fit into this this ist idea like your psychiatrist or this this little kind of just this existence that believe is basically an ideology that sees the world in a certain way but because he's and that's the good thing is like at the end he, he's not really a psychiatrist anymore he's just more of a holistic individual who kind of just sees things with deep like deviations and like and and differences instead of it just being this like i'm a behaviorist or i am this and like you know it's, it's like it's getting a more holistic understanding of the world so it's yeah. like yeah, so, and that's a good thing. Like that's that's perfect. That's what is needed, and that's um, yeah. And yeah. another experience too is, uh, I was going through like a particularly uh, dodgy period in my life, as everyone does. And you know, it's so easy to to talk nowadays, especially you you, you, so you can get a label slapped on you, and you can weaponize mental health as a way not to do anything. Um, and uh, I guess that's you know, people don't like to hear that because. Uh, of like the culture we like to call the culture uh, and believe me I've taken advantage of that throughout my life but basically people in my family at this time were, were worried about me and they were like oh you go to a psychiatrist and, and get checked out and I was like I'm pretty sure I'll be I'll be fine because I've you know attended therapy and um, I feel like maybe I'm completely wrong but I have a, li a little bit more knowledge of like my uh, internal world than than uh, than might be given credit so I go anyways, j just to just to do the thing and and sort of uh, make them happy at the time. And I have a chat with this psychiatrist, and I said I lay out exactly like all of the problems that came up in the last two years. And she's like, "Oh yeah, there's absolutely nothing wrong with you. You don't have any problems. It's just that you have you've had a, a, a an unusual, you know, a, a sort of hard, you know, Western two years like." Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, you know, like you're not starving or anything, like, but but, but you're, uh, yeah, you, you know, you've had some issues, like, and no wonder it's it's a bit difficult for you, you know. Uh, but yeah, again, like this, you know, she didn't go ahead and fucking load me up with, with medication when I could just explain all these things that happened. But uh, but uh, yeah, again, just just filling out the nuance there. I, I see a lot of shit yeah, about the medical industry and therapy as well. Uh, and of course, you, of course, you don't need therapy. Uh, and there's plenty of arguments against it. Like, you know, you, you could go to uh, young called Catholics, the sanest people that there are. And I think that was in part because of um, the sacraments. So like the Eucharist and uh, confession and confession just mm. acts, acts as like mass psychotherapy. And you hear Don yeah. Perry as well talk about this. Uh, it, it like helps you get back into alignment at, at one moment. Um, so atonement. And, and that's free. Yeah. Exactly. So it, again, Creighton talks about this, and, and it's it's just it's 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 almost like it's almost too too simple or too 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 uh, obvious to uh, yeah. I'm sure there's more nuance to it. But he said like in, in the Enlightenment age, uh, before Enlightenment, you know, we had this religious worldview uh, where where um, the religions acted as a way to uh, 
work with the forces of the mind. And then when we lost the ability to look at the, the world through um, a religious worldview uh, after the Enlightenment, then uh, the cure for the soul moved from religion to uh, Freud psychoanalysis. Um, and then that's simply what therapy is, but it still does its work. And it definitely, you know, helped me understand myself. And essentially it's, uh, it's also someone who's, uh, someone who is stable and, uh, and mirrors back to you uh, experiences. Yeah. You hear a lot of shit about these um, industries, but they can be very good. Yeah. I mean, it's like, and it's to a degree, like having that religious, being a part of a religious community is more cathartic than possibly you know more more of an expression of emotion more expression of what's inside than possibly you know going to a psychiatrist and getting fueled on drugs obviously and or something like that so it's yeah. like there's that element that it fulfills more as well where catharsis is catharsis is yeah. Pos- yeah it's more possible because that's really what it is it's, it's expressing the emotion and it's what i was saying in like a video i, I put up a minute ago is like well yesterday mm. it's the relatability that is what brings us catharsis so it's like you go to a theater you watch a film you can relate to that film on a deep emotional level and it brings you to tears or it can make you laugh or it can make you express emotion right but it's also the same with certain communities where they come together you know you could go back to like certain rituals religious rituals any of those things like communion or any of any of those kind of forms of Mm -hmm. a ritual where there's something that you collectively understand which you tap into which brings out the emotions and that's and this could be in any form any form of emotion could be through the expression of aggression even through kind of some sort of kind of masculine form of initiation or some sort of you know even like when you know people used to get initiated into manhood it'd be through courage so then it'd be for aggression and seeing if they can go beyond the aggression or go beyond the fear of the mm-hmm. unknown which would be the expression of the gods to them which they would have been in fear of because at that point they would be going against the they'd be breaking it in a sense the social law of what they grew up in as a boy so they'd be breaking that that law and it's interesting like even in social law um, and the same thing goes into like, you know, Nietzsche talking about how religion sort of forms like slave morality in a way, which I can agree a little bit on to, a, to an extent, but there's too much nuance to say, oh, yes, it is or it isn't. But it's yeah. like, he said, like Joseph Campbell was talking about Dharma or social law and that most religions fulfill these social laws in society. And these social laws, laws could be, you know, anything on survival pleasure and power so mm-hmm. the, the prayer system or the system of prayer would be based on my survival which would be you know a, f- a fertility power um and all of these other things which would be basically the animalistic instincts mm-hmm. so and, and and in a sense that would be the lower form of man or the more animal form of man and you could say, well, that's an enslavement to your animalistic instinct because you're basing your religious uh, spiritual prayer or your desire on these kind of base instincts in a way. And he was saying, oh, they're, they're like the bottom chakras, they're like the one to the third chakra or something. And he was saying, you know, this is what keeps us in a kind of enslaved animalistic instinct system because it's like, you know, what... We had, we had we've had religious wars and they were based on again animal instincts of like let's the, the, say the crusades of overpowering certain positions dominating having power yeah all of these types of things which were insane because i i, I think i think i remember reading into at some point there was the cruise in the crusades the people that went to fight these religious wars they would sign over their their ownership of their property i think to the religious institutions and when they died the religious institutions took over the ownership of that property so that in a sense they kind of grew their domination mm. by doing that and it's i can't remember the specifics of that but it was like uh something i remember there but um but yeah it's like and this is where kind of like the 
Buddhist side of, of Eastern tradition is quite useful to get that perspective of kind of falling out of that. And in a sense, it kind of even links in with Nietzsche's slave morality in a different kind of way, because we're being slaves to our instincts or we're being slaves to kind of domination in a sense or right. our, our drives. Right. Help me understand that. I don't get that. So social law, the social law of religion helps us, keeps us pinned to our animal instincts. Yeah. So certain things in which maintain the power of the ego or the the kind of the structure of the of what can give us power so like um so it could be things to do things that would be more conquering so things that would go towards a kind of position where we're not in communion with other people mm. or we're, we're in more of a we're, there's no compassion in a sense there's no unity or harmony with others so it's mm more animalistic it's not humanistic you could say it's more because humans are kind of beyond that you know that's what makes us human we're, we're not animals mm -hmm. you know which is kind of why i'm like eh, evolution eh, you know it's kind of like we're not really animals we're kind of we've yeah you could say we've evolved away from animals mm -hmm. or being an animal but at the same time there's something divine for, with us that isn't seen yeah. in animals but yeah. it's like um but yeah right. it's kind of going to yeah what this brings up for me is is going back to the unconscious and how the unconscious is structured so if you look at the jewish god uh, is a, an unimaginal ambivalent force you don't know if he's hot or cold like you look at uh, Job, and then if you look at the christian god he's embodied and all good so then if if you go with the idea that uh, our religious tradition structure our unconscious minds uh, uh freud was jewish so his view of uh, the unconscious was it was chaotic bubbling forces that you had to be contained and jung's view was that it was structured and uh purposeful and the the font of all creativity It's, it was also it's also noticeable in in Christian psychoanalysts that they're less likely to look at uh, um, harshness and evil. Hmm. Uh, so there, it's funny that could lead into it being more of a coddly sort of a, a thing uh, in the West because we're, we're we're heavily Christianized. But then if you go to a Freudian analyst, they're supposed to be harsher and colder. <laughs> and and with that with that like i i think i think your view there is like is actually like partly christian because if you if you if you strip back if you strip back everything and you sort of look at like the it's a terrifying thing and then, and then this is this is part of like the a, the christian shadow work or whatever is that you when you strip back all of the uh all of the stuff in front of, uh, oh, let me see. When you when you get down to it and you get past all of the stuff that we've learned um, from society, you know, we have to get along, we have to be do this, we have to do that. And you get down to the real uh, nature, uh, your, your own nature. Uh, it's, a, it's a, and this is probably a lot of projection too, but if you just look at wars, if you look at, you know, uh, fighters, it's like, you, it's a lot it's a lot it's a lot more chaotic and violent uh than mm. you'd like it than you'd like and when you see that in yourself yeah uh, that's that's absolutely terrifying and then this is what peterson talks about by growing growing teeth because once you see how how absolutely um uh, there's the the destruction that you're capable of then you can have respect for yourself but the, I guess the, the problem, the other problem with that is then you will, you, you project that into everyone else. So the world becomes mm. a, a way more competitive, dangerous place. So, so mm. like, so then what you have to do, I guess, to, to wipe away these projections is you have to be very curious. And James Krantz, I was just talking with him. He's like a, a, a great systems thinker. He's like one of the best systems thinkers in the world. Like he's he said that the only cure to to projection 
and is is curiosity uh, or one of the best cures is curiosity so you know if you're trying to fucking sort your shadow out uh be curious and mm. projecting all over the place yeah it's super interesting like um it's like certain it's weird because it's like saying that unconsciously there's certain scholars or people that would get popular from say joseph campbell was saying this this thing about the free dharmas and it's these religions main religions popular religions sticking you inside that kind of animalistic drive that keeps us away from truly finding compassion and union with others um, well, I, don't, I, don't, like, I don't see that though because the the, mm. the, the christian the christian it, it splits you off the christian psyche splits you off from the animal and it makes you, it, it's like, it's all about mm. communion and mm. uh, loving the other. And it's yeah. like, you know, the Christian message uh, on the front, obviously, there's so much depth to it. Just go and read like, or watch Peugeot. But um, mm. like the, the highest serves the lowest is like the Christian message. Mm. And it, that's, you know, if you read it like very, very. Uh, mm. But yeah, even the splitting itself. It's, it's, yeah. It, yeah, exactly. It's, the, it's the, split off evil. Yeah. It splits yeah. off evil. And again, Creighton talks about this, and he has, he has a lot of experience in this. And he says that, the, and Jung said this as well, the problem with the Christian mind is that it's prone to projecting evil outward because it can't. they can't see, we have less uh, capability of seeing evil in ourselves because it, the, the God is split. Mm. It's, the, the, yeah. The devil is outside of the, the mm. Trinity. That's so interesting. It's like um, because even if you go down some of the the, the more Buddhist, the, the multiple gods that they would you know worship, there's yeah. gods in there that represent what a Christian would see as very evil, but yeah. then they'd still worship it anyway because it, they'd possibly see it as being more within them as well. Also, mm -hmm. um, but yeah it's like there's there's a point he's making there with the whole keeping it within our animal instincts because there's no unified compassion in a sense because it's like well at the end of the day there's multiple different religions that disagree and there's a divide and yeah. there's difference and they're and they're going to disagree and they're not going to be in union with each other even though the christian may believe that oh i'm you know love thy neighbor but do, do you love your islamic neighbor that type of thing you know maybe not so it's like it's like there's this there's this split still but i i tell you, i you know i don't you know specifically like oh i'm agreeing with this or anything like that it's just it's really interesting at the end oh, yeah there's, well there's endless nuance like you could be frozen into silence but you know you have to talk at some point like you have to you have to yeah. at some point and it's interesting that you say muslim like you know I, i'm in uh, istanbul at the moment uh in uh Kadikoy on the asian side and uh we went to see uh, the Hagia Sophia the last day, which is a, it was built in like 500 AD by one of the Roman emperors. And like, this is fucking Constantinople, like, and that, yeah. that was initially built as a Christian cathedral. And then it was in the religious wars, I guess. I, I actually don't know the history, but I'm guessing it was like some sort of a, a conflict. It was turned into a mosque and then uh, back and forth between mosque and, and, and cathedral, I believe. And then it became a museum and now it's a mosque again. And I go in and you can see all the Christian icons on, on the, in the, in the, I think it's called the narthex. When you walk in, you can see the Christian icons and the Christian icons. And then you look down and then in this like absolute crazy cathedral, all of the Christian icons are covered by the, by the names of the uh, Islamic prophets, wow. like absolute domination. And then at the top of the back of the church, the apps at the back, there are all the Christian icons, the divine child, they're covered by cloth. It's like, get out of here. And uh, wow. and my my experience there, this, there was like a specific spot. While it was very touristy, there was thousands of people in there. No one had masks on. It's great, uh, no. But uh, the uh, no. there was a sacred space where people could go up and pray. And Roy, I take off. Uh, we have, you have to take off your shoes in a mosque, anyway. So I, I'm like, all right, let's let's do this. And I, I woke up and I I walk up beside the, um, the generally older men uh, praying. And regardless of it being a, a like a Muslim or a, mo a mosque or whatever, you, I still you still feel that 
uh, lift upward. You still feel the like you're being you're in a place that is like sacred. You still feel that. You, you, it's like a bodily feeling. I'm, uh, it's a bodily feeling. I'm sure many people can re can relate to this. Hopefully in the comments, but you, you get lifted upward. And, and Campbell talks about this as well. He used to go and visit when he studied in Paris or France. He used to go to a specific cathedral and he feel himself being lifted upwards. It's like you're on a different you're on a different plane. And yeah, and that's that's just to sort of bridge the, the different religions there. It's, it's it's still moving towards the same experience, it seems like. And then in the gym yesterday, you know, I, I can't speak Turkish at all. And yet, you know, I go to the gym and I, I love talking to people and trying to, you know, talk to people, get to know, get to know the, mm. the locality. And there's this one guy, you know, in there and he, he, he can't speak a lick of English. And the two of us like become like best mates and we're, we're like li lifting weights and we start like spotting each other and we're lifting together and it was great and i'm like laughing and he's like oh you he's like uh mma he's like jujits and i'm like oh, a little bit and he's like oh it's nice and uh anyways we get to it and i'm, I'm wearing a, a cross i'm wearing the christian cross and he looks he looks at it and and uh he uh he smiles and he goes Oh, like Isa, 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 Christ. And then he goes, ah, Muhammad, 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 Muhammad. And like, he's we're, like, we're laughing about it. And you oh know, my God, we're laughing yeah. about it. And we, we are like, you know, I'm like, I'm like, uh, whatever, show respect to, to his God. And there's a lot more nuance and it, it's a lot easier to tie people together than, than, uh, than you'd think if you're, if you're just, you know, getting all your information from fucking Twitter and all these articles online is, uh, the, hu the humanity, uh, shines through. That's beautiful though. Cause it's, it's what connected that moment was the body and how the body speaks a thousand words more than anything else. Cause that, that's what unified that situation even though it's just like a, a, a small little situation it's like oh you're doing an activity with your body which you're putting your energy into and that's understood because it's it's relatable so it's like you're you're doing this this thing which and that's kind of the what people need to do more of is get into their body and that's what even like the whole Nietzschean philosophy is kind of about as well as the Dionysian instincts of falling into those powers fulfilling those powers through the instincts so that we can actually become more than just you know these this this cerebral thinker who divides humanity through what i believe is god and what is not god and all of this it's like but what's truly god at that point is the thing that connects individuals which in that instance is through the body you know it's it's doing this activity in which aligns people together like going to the gym you know you, you're trying to align yourself all the people in there are aligning themselves to the same thing on an individual level of of being becoming a more superior form of self towards health or towards any of that type of stuff so it's like that's just so interesting like that it's kind of gives you the philosophy of the physical physical action physical body to yeah. get initiated into that more than more than any kind of because the, the thing is like oh no i'm muslim i'm muslim <laughs> you know it's just like it's so interesting it it, it puts a uh, a stop in the door at that point yeah so well, yeah it's a stop in the door and i grew up most of my life okay i i did you know did not listen in school i did terrible initially in in um high school here in ireland didn't listen uh, whatever i had serious behavioral issues um for one reason or another and it, as a result, just was not educated about the world at all. I'm like, I'm still catching up. Mm. And I come from the country in Ireland. So I was like, you know, standard country bumpkin, uh, very, very, very naive to the world. And the young said in his autobiography, his favorite person in school was the naive country kid. <laughs> and it's because that because you don't know about all the divide and all the complexity in the world so mm. you're less scared and you're more open mm. so as soon as all of these layers of complexity start coming on i mean the, the less able you are to deal with that you know it can it can it really weighs on you you know 
Mm-hmm. And you and you hear Peterson talk about that. What like, the people who are more intelligent are more miserable because I I wonder if it's because you you see all this complexity. It's like, how the fuck do I deal with all of this? I uh, uh, and I guess like it's it's like you're you're giving birth. You're like birthing yourself into higher consciousness. Something like this, you know. Mm. Yeah, and it's like me. I was like the naive barbarist. Like I just wanted to be barbaric against like school i hate school like you know it's like fuck, i hated school like yeah. i just i just it did not fulfill me at all except for doing music because my music teacher kind of remember back to in music that she kind of understood kind of where i was coming from with things but everything else was just horrible i hated it and i was just like i just want to destroy school so i was just like this kind of this kind of you know you know uh devious kind of kid growing up who's like doing things he shouldn't have been doing and all that type of thing and then and then yeah it's just like it's it's so it's so weird because there's some people that don't become like that and some some people that do and mm-hmm. then and then it's interesting now that we're having this conversation and which not everyone's going to have these types of conversations and it's like seeing through these these aspects or or these issues at hand and trying to see a kind of answer to it because you know even politically like i don't like politics i think it's like a divided thing as well but like politically i'll probably be like an anarchist in some sense mm-hmm. not in the anarchist that like it's like oh we destroy everything and burn everything for the sake of burning it like not that but like something that's more we need to get rid about this political dialectic of red and blue and, and fucking you know i think it's there to divide people from really becoming whole because not one or the other is true or false it's this false dichotomy of good and bad with in relation to myself this whole like issue you know mm. like well it's, it's alienating a, it's alienating but, but uh, also taking uh taking a stance is terrifying because you mm. you you uh bring on people's projections again you get a lot of people against you so if you take a stance you're you're it's gonna bring absolutely it's gonna bring a lot of pain to your life like so so it, it takes it takes serious yeah. goals you know to to take a stance to take a stance on something yeah i mean yeah it's just saying about aliens right <laughs> this is the thing about aliens you, you like there's about this, aliens. There's this... we're talking about aliens right now we're talking about aliens Aliens are so crazy, man. Like this, this idea is, is is mind blowing in a way because it, the idea that aliens, we are aliens in the future, mm. and now they are coming back to figure out how to become human again. I think I think there's a possibility to this because it's like, where is humanity going now? Mm. Left hemispheric, cerebral, analytical, understanding things rather than inner standing things being the observer from out where we see things from outside ourselves instead of seeing them where where we are part of it like the observation problem within um which was proven you know there's this observation issue where we when we observe something it changes how it happens mm. you know how it actually proceeds how it how it unfolds but the scientist he is disconnected from what he does he's he's trying to be the observer from a third perspective where he's not involved to try and see things and this is like the alien. It, the alien mirrors this kind of existence where we're, and then now we destroyed God. So now we're trying to find God again with frustration, but the scientist is frustrated. We're like, oh, at CERN, if we don't find a God particle, then uh, then what are we gonna do? We can't find a God particle. It's like in the sense that they want to find it because they, they do believe in God, but they have to affirm it through their ideology. It's really weird, but it's like, um. So it's like we're constantly seeking, and we destroyed God of the previous aeons, if you if you if you want to say it like that. And now we're trying to seek God out through space and time. And I see it as like what we're eventually going to do is, after all this seeking and observing and understanding, which is putting our knowledge of the world underneath us, where we we see it with superiority as if we are above the world and above nature, we're yeah. in turn over time gonna see ourselves reflect in the waters and we are the aliens we are the individuals who are going to be 
alienated from the world and from knowledge itself because we've become disconnected from what we do. Interesting. And then it's like, I, I see it as, and there's this, it's so weird because it's just like, it represents even the, 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 what people recall as what the gray alien looks like. It's like, it's the same philosophy of what modern man's going towards. It's like just this extremely cerebral, untouched with ourselves, our shadow in sense. We're not trying to understand our emotions. We won't express them. But we're we're trying to find an answer which is disconnected from ourselves in a way. It's just like it's kind of like the alien for God outside of themselves. That's yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, and in secular countries, I was saying this to you. In secular countries, psychiatrists uh, report in like the wards delusions of uh, like the paranoid schizophrenia um, delusion is that the FBI or whatever are watching you, like a governmental authority. And then in the in the religious uh, societies uh, in the east is where I heard this. So like in in uh, Arabic countries, is that they have uh, fears of that they they are or that the antichrist is watching, that they are the antichrist or the or, yeah. or that the antichrist is watching. So so like you can see the 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 split between the split between the secular and the and the uh, religious there too. Yeah. It's, it's so, there's a book called The Influencing Machine. Yeah. Um, it's about his schizophrenic. Schizophrenic, I mean, there's something very interesting about the delusions of a schizophrenic. Because mm. there's, because in that book, it kind of illustrates this kind of interest of, well, maybe he had a point or that the schizophrenic produces from their, you know, from their insight that they have things which then unravel to happen in, in the future. So like stuff like um, certain forms of like FBI interrogation through like microchips and stuff like this or stuff, all this type of weird kind of like conspiratorial delusion, mm -hmm. which would be kind of pushed towards as being, oh, that's schizophrenic, actually becomes reality because some sort of insight of evolution can be attained from that by, by mm -hmm. certain people, which then they can use to yeah. then so, so it's like it's, it's so weird it's like the most perplexing thing well it's like um it's not what shamans but back in the old days the the shamans had like schizophrenic breaks and the schizophrenic break sent you into the other world and then the the cure is that you, you when they come back out of the other world they can then cure people who are who are also breaking as well mm. because they can see, it, they can see into the other world whatever this is and, and I wonder is is seeing into this other world simply looking at uh, you know looking at pure nature, mm. at pure nature that we did get disconnected from through or like deceit and lies maybe in our families because you know there's there's a lot of lies, um, well from conversations I've had and own experience and it's it's generally not anything uh, malicious. Uh, more often than not, but you know the the the, the easy white lies and lies that go around in families um, do something to split split you off from immediate experience. I don't exactly know how all these connect, but there's there's something there that I have to work out. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, man, we're going some, down some crazy rabbit hole right now. But like, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's never ending. It doesn't end. It's a, it's a black hole and it's just a void. It just sucks you in. It keeps sucking in the light. So, <laughs> but um, it's, it's, yeah, but like even back on that, God, like, so yeah, even like back on the, the meditation and kind of like seeing these images, it's like, mm. Yeah, Jung was saying like uh, the use of the term meditation in the hermetic dictum, quote, and as all things proceed from the one through the meditation of the one must therefore be understood in this alchemical sense as a creative dialogue by means of which things from an unconscious potential state to manifest one. So it's like our connection with the unconscious is a creative dialogue and then we can use that connection 
as a way of bringing out creativity. And it's like I was bringing this up a little bit as well because David, uh, what's his name? Certain director, I can't remember his name now, but he, he made the film Blue Velvet and Twin Peaks, the, the series right. Twin Peaks. I can't remember his name. But like, um, he created this idea or he kind of visualized the, this idea of that you're in a sense a fishing rod and you drop down into the unconscious through meditation and you use transcendental meditation to create that isolation point which you then go into and then that acts in a sense as a as the bait on, a, on the on the end of a fishing rod which then can get caught and the fish will catch it and that will be the idea so you kind of put yourself in a state where through transcendental meditation which i was talking about mantras i was saying like you can use a mantra in a within a discipline so you do it for music poetry anything like that where you can then use that to then meditate on that and then through the unconscious you could say all of this content will splurge out from within you and that, that's definitely been my experience with music is that you would use and the people who have done music you, you use DAWs, um, music software. You can, you know, of course, if anything, you can loop over a melody. And I would use that melody, the looping of it, to then allow that to initiate other forms of creative uh, licks. So it could be melodies, choruses, all of this type of stuff from that one melody. So you'd be using that to kind of fall into a state of kind of the subconscious, if you will, because it's still, it's still active. It's really a form of active imagination because you're, you're trying to actively imagine what would fit with that piece. And it's like you can do that with all these other forms of creativity, if you wish. Cool. So it's like that's kind of what I was thinking of with regards to meditation. But also, it also goes back to this thing where, you know, it things from an unconscious potential state to manifest one or that is a creative dialogue. And that dialogue then gives you an answer if you interact with it in a way right interesting yeah they, i'm reminded of um again Jung thought that the unconscious was a mirror also so he thought that mm. he thought that basically the way that you view the unconscious it mirrored that back to you and then uh, this also mirrors like the old mystics as well, who talked about God and said, God is like a mirror who will give you back what you give him. Hmm. Yeah. God is a mirror. The old Jewish mystics, man, these guys are fucking crazy. Anyways, mate, um, is there anything else that you yeah, want to... You wanna... Is there anything you want to um, touch on before we wrap? No, I think we can wrap it up in. I mean, you kind of we kind of went over a lot of stuff there, and it's like um, there's no. It was kind of more just experimentation, like just to see what would come out from the depths of this conversation, you know. But it's like super interesting that you had that experience and potentially could kind of as illustrated to you and like how things work in this kind of crazy paradoxical way but yeah man i think it's super interesting that you had that and it's like um uh very thankful for you sharing that experience you know even though because these things can be very personal so it's like um you know thanks for sharing it yeah no worries at all no worries at all uh, uh yeah the, the more you talk to people about these sorts of things uh the more that it's funny the, the more that you you get it reflected back at you again like what they just said about the unconscious and, unconscious and God. I guess you get what you give. But uh, many people I've talked to have had similar experiences. Like I've talked to many like priests and uh, many individuals, and like, oh yeah, I've like I've had like similar things happen. So mm. yeah, I, I, you know, it can be a bit weird. Um, it can feel a bit weird saying this. It can be, be a bit unsettling because like most people in the world will, will think you're crazy, but um, you'll have that, I guess. Yeah, we've got to break that, that wall of judgment, people judging 
people for these experiences when they're completely natural you know they're, they're in touch with your soul in some sense you know they're they're soul related you know yeah. we, we can't we can't suppress the soul because this is it's kind of like what the situation we're in now is like things suppress the soul mm. and and it's like even through drug use psychiatry bad food all of this stuff it's all suppressing the soul it's it's all and and the soul is the conscience which guides us forth even if it's something that it says within us that it's maybe daunting and contradicting to like the safety of what we exist in, you mm -hmm. know so it's like we just got to listen to that and like make sure it's something we encourage out of other people but like if people were interested in what we were talking about a second ago about mayor room society it's something me and Adon has uh, ha we have been creating over the past few months now and it's been turning out very well i mean we've developed like a program to kind of like fundamentally help with people on their kind of hero's journey in a sense mm -hmm. and it's to kind of initiate people into a space where they take authority in their own lives and we've kind of been building a system where we bring up and build kind of different disciplines within the program that can help people with that so it's like on fitness nutrition individuation mindfulness all of these different aspects and even we're probably going to bring in um more of this which is uh you know public speaking storytelling improv to kind of help people get out of their kind of comfort zones of being not spontaneous so mm -hmm. it's like that's another thing that we're probably going to be developing more in so if people are interested in checking that out there'll be a link in the description to that and uh, if, if any people are, who are watching this who want to do like a free one-on-one -on -one kind of discovery call on that then you can get involved in it and we can have a conversation with you and run you down the whole how the whole system works really for sure for sure all right yeah gotta go mate uh um, right, all right great chatting we'll uh talk to you soon all right absolutely man enjoy turkey and the rest of the time you're in there